What is your story? That's a common question in our culture as we try to figure people out, understand, and relate to others. Our stories make up our lives. People have been compiling stories since the beginning. Now there are the big stories. Why are we here? How did the universe come to be? Who or what is God? And is there meaning to life? And then there are our stories, such as family, career, our faith, our struggles. All these stories are important. During this series, we will seek to connect the big stories with our stories. And in that connecting, we will find the stories of our faith. Come, join us in worship, in small groups, and in panels around the building as we answer, What's Your Story? We live in a culture where people do not know the stories of our faith. In Culpeper, Virginia, I promise you, there's not one or two people. There are lots of people who just simply do not know the story of our faith. And I would say there are going to be hopefully thousands of people in our community attending churches all over our community today. And many of those people, many of us, either don't know the story of our faith or don't know it well enough that we could articulate it. And so over the next several weeks, I want us to kind of deal with some of the stories of our faith, see if we can get the foundation stones put in. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important that we read the Bible together, and we've been doing that since the beginning of this year, and there's another opportunity to do that at the end of this month. I want to make sure we are reading Scripture together so that we are together learning the story of our faith. And my hope is as we do this over the next several weeks that we'll start to connect our stories to the great big story of God. And we'll see this wonderful connection between those two things. Now, you might be asking, why did I choose the stories that we're going to go over over the next uh, seven or so weeks? Well, I want to make sure you understand this. I didn't choose them. The Wednesday night group back in the spring chose these stories. So if you think we, they should have chosen other stories, I want you to let them know that. You complain to them. I'm just preaching what they said to preach, all right? So, you know, coming on Wednesday night gives you some advantages. You get to, to pick the stories. And the assignment I gave them last spring was if there was somebody who came into our church and had no knowledge, no knowledge of any of the stories of the Bible, what are the six or seven stories you feel like they've got to know in order to get it? And so that's how we kind of picked these stories. Now, the next part of the assignment was the more difficult one. I said, once we got these six or seven stories, I said, I want you to work around tables and figure out how you would tell the story to somebody who had no faith background. And they did a really lousy job at that. <laughs> I got nothing from them on that. And so over the next few weeks, I'm going to try to do that, and I'm going to also fail miserably at that. And you want to know why? Because my whole life, I've been telling the stories of the Bible within the context of a church. And I'm real comfortable telling stories of faith in the context of church people. But when I have to articulate our stories to people who have no background, it's really challenging. And so I'm going to try that over the next seven weeks, and I want you to give me some grace, and I want to give us all a lot of grace as we try to tell our story of faith to a world who I believe very much wants to hear it. Let's all work together in telling the story well in a way that's accessible for many. Now let me illustrate this to you by telling you the story of me and math. Okay? I'm going to tell you my story of math. I'm going to go off of the faith story and just tell you my story of math. I was doing fine in math until the seventh grade. And in the seventh grade, the story of math for me 
changed dramatically. They introduced something to me called algebra. Now, I understand that today we do that like in second grade, but when, <laughs> when I was a kid, they didn't do that till the seventh grade. And from that point on, I never understood math again. And I tried. My mom's here today. She probably would say I might not have tried hard enough, but I did try. And I liked people that knew math. I liked hanging around with those folks. But you know, I never understood math. And when my children in second and third grade started coming home with their math homework, and I would look at it and have no earthly idea how to help them. And so thankfully, my wife is pretty good at math, and she could help them through math. And thankfully, they've always had really good teachers who would help them with math. So they've got the basics. And, and I still like people who are good at math. I, I like hanging around with them. I don't have anything against them. I'm just real intimidated when we start talking about math. Because for me, after the seventh grade, I was completely lost when it came to math. Now, I hope when I tell you that story, you don't say things like, well, how dumb is that guy? <laughs> he should have gotten that foundation at home. I blame his parents for not giving him that math foundation. And I hope you don't say things like, yet more evidence that our country is just headed nowhere because Dan doesn't understand algebra. Or some of you who are a little more gentle, gentle you might say, well, maybe we can reach his children, but it's always going to be a struggle to reach Dan in math. Maybe we could start a new service for Dan in math and kind of dumb it down for him. And maybe he could get it, and, and why he wouldn't understand the fullness of all of this, we could give him a little participation certificate and let Dan go on in math. See, I have a tough story of math, and really the only thing that helped me in math or that changed my story in math is when I went to college, I failed the nicest professor who's ever taught math in the history of the world. And then the second semester, I came back into his class. And again, he, he, didn't teach me, he, he didn't treat me like a dummy. He treated me so kindly. And I had a friend who walked with me that whole semester, understanding I was never going to be a math major, I was never going to be an astronaut, anything like that. But he knew that I needed to pass that math if I was ever going to be a pastor, if I was ever going to get married, if I was ever going to have three kids. And so he walked with me and helped me get through math and helped me get at least a story of math in my life. Friends, my story of math is like many people's story of faith. They're not mad at us. They don't hate God. They, they just, for whatever reason, didn't get it. And, and for many people, it does happen in their teenage and young adult years. They get to a point and they say, man, this makes no sense, and I'm leaving. I'm walking away from this. And then for increasing numbers of people in our culture, they just never got exposed to it. They, they just don't know there's anything about algebra. And so I want to make sure that as we work on telling our stories of faith, that we tell it in a way that makes them approachable for people who are, who are not mad at us, who just have never had the opportunity. And, and so I want us to jump in this morning with the foundational story for every person who has ever lived on earth. And this is a story that crosses cultures, crosses religions, ca crosses language. Every, every, group of people have some story of creation. Throughout human history, people with whatever science knowledge, historical knowledge, and faith knowledge they have, have been asking the question, how did we get here? Who is responsible? And what is my place? What is our place 
in this world. Throughout human history, people have been asking that question. And there have been differing accounts to the answer to that question throughout human history, depending on geography and culture and time and place. Now, we connect our story with the first faith story of the people of God. Our story comes from a people and a time and a place. And there was discussions then about the origins of everything and how, make, how to make sense of it all. And the early people of faith, with all of that in their hearts and minds, begin their story of faith not with how did all this come to be, but who started all of this. And they begin their story of faith. Within the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Prior to time as we know it, there was God. Prior to matter in the material universe, all that we touch and see, prior to all of that, there was God. And so the big story in Genesis 1 and 2 is God. It's not humanity. It's not the days or the process of creation. It's not even the result of creation. The story is the God of creation. Friends, don't miss that story. Certainly don't miss it arguing smaller stories. Our story affirms that God called the world into being. Our story affirms that the gift of our lives has been given by him. And the primary purpose of Genesis is to reveal the reality and the character of God as creator. They didn't sit down and say, boy, let's write down every nook and cranny of this story. The story for them was God started it. And here's how it happened. Don't lose the big story. It's possible to become so muddled in detailed explanation of Genesis that we fail to encounter the God of Genesis. Have you ever been in those conversations? We've written book after book after book after book arguing with science. But have we talked enough about the God who created us and the God who gives our life meaning and purpose? <clears throat> and in that story, in Genesis 1 and 2, there is a closeness and there is a distance. The closeness is God's constant attention to his creation day after day. And creation's ready response. You know, you could sing Genesis 1 and 2 if you wanted to. And God says, let there be. And when God says, let there be, the response of creation is not, well, who are you? The response is not, well, not today. I'm not interested in participating with you. No, the response of creation is to do it. Creation delights in the will of the creator. See, friends, we're not compelled into this relationship. We're not compelled into this story of God. We are joyfully included. And the people that you know who do not know God, who do not know this story, do they understand that they are joyfully included? That's the closeness of our story. And then the distance of our story is that the Creator allows for freedom of action, freedom of choice. You see, the creation is not overpowered by the Creator. In the grace of God, 
is that this creature he has called into being, he now lets be. We're not robots. And so the distance of giving us the freedom to choose. In all the other stories of our beginnings, in all the other stories today of our beginnings, I want to talk about compelling and coercing and dominating. And most stories end up either on one extreme or the other of the closeness and distance scale, where he's so close that it's coercive and it's domineering or oppressive, or the creator is so distant that it just doesn't matter. What we do is what we do. Nobody cares. Nobody's paying attention to this great world. And so many people in our culture live on on one of those extremes. Either God is constantly on top of me, constantly forcing my every move, or God just doesn't care or doesn't exist. And yet our story is of God's gracious power that creates us not out of duty or obligation but creates us in his own image. And that God chooses that the one way he is visible in this world is through the image of God in us. And that's an amazing story. And that's an amazing way to live. It's a really great story. So if you're a person of faith and you have a problem with the size of the universe or the age of the earth or the idea of evolution, then your story of God is way too small. And if you're a person of science and you say, hey, you got to prove this stuff to me, and you have trouble with the idea of a creator God who is beyond time and space and all-powerful and all-loving, then your reasoning, your scientific method, lacks true rigor. You see, the unfortunate thing that's happened to us in the story of our beginning is that for people of faith... We've got to break it down to something we can understand and explain. And I want to make sure you get that I'm guessing if us really smart people were writing Genesis 1 or 2, we might have filled up the rest of the pages of the Bible with this stuff. And they said, you know, we don't need to understand every nook and cranny. What we want to affirm is that God, in the beginning God, And so don't get stuck into answering every single question of science. Affirm the story of our faith that in the beginning, God. And so, and then we get stuck in the story of science. That if we can't see it or understand it, then it just can't be. And we miss that great story of creation. Verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. See, I'm concerned that in our community, there are people who drove out to go to Skyline Drive this morning or went out to go fishing on a river or are hanging out right now at the athletic fields or down here at Yale Park, and they're enjoying a beautifully good Sunday. And while they might not be able to connect everything to the Creator, they're having a good morning. And my concern is while they're doing that, people have gathered in churches, and we've come together not real sure that the creation is good and not real sure that the image of God is revealed through us. And I want to challenge us this morning to wake up this week, each day, 
and say, God saw all that he had made, and it was good. Could we start our day like that, each day this week? And if we did that, how would it change our stories? Wake up this morning, God, all that you have made is good. Will that change some relational dynamics within marriages and families? Will that change how some of our folks interact with children at schools? Will it change how you relate to a coworker? How you deal with a health challenge? Will it change how you view the world around us? God saw all that he was made, and it was good. He's the creator. He's continuing to do his new creation. Let's look out for it. And like the first people of faith, let's celebrate it. And let's claim it as his creation. Will you pray with me?